Okay, we're going to get started with Scott Burley from JPL talking about what's new with Ion, and it turns out there's quite a bit because he's been very busy. Uh, uh, great. Um, uh, thanks. Um, uh, th this is uh, the speaking slot immediately after lunch, during which everyone traditionally falls asleep. Please feel free. Um, I'll, uh, I'll say things that you may pay attention to or may not, and that'll be fine either way. Uh, next slide, please. So um, th th what I'll be talking about is uh, uh, the latest uh, work that's been done in the uh, interplanetary overlay network implementation of delay tolerant networking, uh, ION. Uh, and just by, by way of uh, background, I'll do a couple of slides sort of showing where uh, ION comes from. Um, this is, of course, uh, old news to everybody. Uh, the terrestrial internet is characterized by continuous end-to-end -end connectivity and very brief round trip times. In the solar system internet, we're expecting to need to be able to handle uh, intermittent point-to-point uh, -point connectivity and, and very long round trip times. Uh, next slide. So uh, th this may or may not be obvious to everybody uh, here, but there are uh, constraints on operating delay tolerant networking in space that are somewhat different from the constraints on DTN and terrestrial networking. In uh, terrestrial DTN, uh, we have uh, um, typically Ethernet or, or Wi-Fi uh, links, which are uh, fast and they're cheap and they're typically symmetrical uh, bandwidth. Uh, we have uh, uh, CPU and memory that are uh, fast, cheap, uh, uh, commodity generic chips, very powerful. We have, um, uh, there are some operational advantages. Rebooting is easy, you push a button on your machine. Uh, dynamic management of memory is, is routine uh, in the event that you run for so long that some latent uh, memory leak shows up, well, you just reboot the machine. It's not a big deal. And um, the operating systems typically are uh, commercial operating systems with, uh, with memory, protected, uh, memory protection modules so that you can have multiple things uh, with their own memory and nothing steps on, it, on anything else. Uh, tasks all run in user space, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, operational safety from that. In deep space, uh, in, in space flight operations, uh, in many cases, these things are just not uh, true. Uh, th the conditions are somewhat different. Um, the links, uh, certainly for, for deep space, and, and to an extent, even for um, uh, Earth orbiting uh, missions, are uh, directed radio or directed optical. Uh, they uh, tend to be highly attenuated because they're uh, very far away often. Uh, they're relatively slow compared to what you can get on, 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 on planetary, uh, on the surface of Earth, uh, in, in the internet. Um, they're very expensive. Um, they're often asymmetrical, that is the, the rate um, at which you receive something from a spacecraft may be very much higher than the rate at which you can transmit to a spacecraft. And so you have to use reception and transmission contacts very efficiently because of, of these kinds of constraints. Similarly, uh, in, uh, in, in space flight, uh, the, because of the radiation uh, environment being very hostile, you typically need to use limited production radiation hardened uh, electronics. Uh, these are relatively slow and very expensive because um, there's a small market for them, so they don't uh, uh, get built in large quantities, and so they're, they're, uh, the, uh, the cost of developing these, these radiation-hardened uh, electronics is not going to be amortized over billions of, of units, but only over hundreds or, or maybe even fewer. Um, and so the processing resources are, uh, are, are scant and, and need to be used efficiently also. Uh, uh, operationally, um, you're not going to be able to push a button uh, on the space station. You, you actually can because you have people there, although it's a difficult thing pushing a button on something that's mounted on the outside of the space station. But for anything in deep space, uh, for the uh, foreseeable future, you're not going to have people available to uh, press a button and, and, and just reset the machine. That's what robots are <laughs> Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, but in general, uh, hands-on repair 
uh, you pretty much can't do it. So you really build these things for uh, for very high durability and uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, robustness, um, and and part of that is that uh, uh, management of dynamic memory is uh, typically uh, frowned on uh, by uh, uh, flight managers because if you do have a leak, you wipe out. You, know, you use up all the memory on the spacecraft, and uh, and and then you have to reboot, and and it's a it's a bad thing whenever you have to uh, go into safe mode on a spacecraft. So uh, typically, um, memory management is uh, there's a fixed amount of memory that you're allowed to have for every operation on, on the on the spacecraft and the flight software, and that's allocated at startup time, uh, and and then. Uh, uh, not all, but memory, but many um, uh, uh, spacecraft are, are operated using flight computers that have real-time operating systems, um, at least as the as, as the uh, uh, attitude control and, and very often the uh, command and data handling uh, processors as well. So there's these real-time operating systems. Typically, there isn't any uh, memory protection. I'm thinking of things like VxWorks, where everything sort of runs in the same memory space. And so it's, um, uh, you don't have the same advantages of, uh, of memory protection that you have in, uh, say, Windows, for example. Um, next slide. So the design of ION was uh, intended to address all of those constraints. Uh, it has uh, its own built-in private memory management system so that you can allocate one fixed chunk of memory to, to ION at the beginning of the mission, and ION manages it privately from then on, and there's never any, uh, any subsequent allocation of, of system memory. Um, there's uh, a built-in uh, object database uh, for um, uh, for uh, data management, uh, and that's that's a high-speed and uh, highly reliable uh, object uh, database system with with a transaction mechanism that's that's built in to enable uh, backing out uh, partial um, uh, updates to the database to avoid um, uh, data integrity problems. Um, that uh, that same transaction mechanism also is used uh, to ensure mutual exclusion, so that you prevent race conditions and, and lockouts. Uh, the bundle headers, uh, uh, the DTN implementation for for, for DTN uh, for for Ion was the uh, the first one to use compressed bundle header encoding because we wanted to be able to shrink the bundle headers down to a small size for transmission for economy in in, in uh, using the bandwidth. Uh, zero copy objects, these are. Uh, it's, it's a mechanism for uh, minimizing not only the amount of space that's occupied by data, but also the amount of time you spend copying it from one buffer to another. Uh, the, if you've got a, a multi-megabyte uh, bundle uh, in, in uh, ION, it'll live in one place and it'll never move from that place. And all that happens is, as you process it through the various demons in the system, all that happens is that uh, pointers to it are, are moved, and, and the, the pointers are, are sort of elaborate pointers that enable you to um, virtually prepend and append uh, headers and trailers to that data without ever touching it. Um, the whole system is written in C for uh, uh, processing economy and, and to keep the footprint small. Uh, at the time I, I put the slide together, it was about 60,000 physical lines of code. It's probably a bit more than that because we've um, uh, added some functions since then. Still, um, I'm sure under 100,000 lines of, of uh, physical code and, and logically uh, uh, quite a lot less than that if you take out uh, white space and comments and so forth. And it's, uh, it's highly portable. Um, the ION system uh, ports pretty easily among uh, POSIX-based operating systems. Um, it's also uh, ported to uh, Windows, um, and it's ported to, to Windows, I would say native Windows, that is when uh, you compile uh, ION uh, for a Windows environment, it creates um, a native uh, Windows EXEs. You don't uh, need to run in the SIGWIN environment, for example. Uh, you just run in Windows. You need 
the uh, uh, MinGW library to do the development, but um, but the um, uh, operating environment is you need. There's a MinGW library that fills in some gaps, and otherwise you're using vanilla um, Windows. Um, next slide. So uh, this is the design of Ion in a nutshell. Um, Really, this is pretty much all that goes on. Uh, the, the object database I referred to before is this thing inside the dotted lines there. Those round things are, are uh, uh, non-volatile um, linked lists, queues of bundles. And essentially all that happens in, in, in ION implementation, in, in, in the ION implementation of DTN is an application issues some data. It gets wrapped in a bundle and placed in, a, in this uh, Um, a, a, a separate routing daemon uh, running at the, at the same time uh, queues, pulls things out of that queue and determines where they're going to go and appends them to a different queue for transmission. And there could be any number of these uh, uh, different queues for, um, uh, for different uh, outducts, we call them, uh, uh, different convergence layer adapters for transmission. Then the outduct itself is this little block down below that uh, has a, a sender uh, uh, library that, that pulls data out of that linked list and uses uh, convergence layer protocol to transmit. Here I'm showing loopback, but that's a, a dotted line from between transmit and receive to show that it could be loopback or it could be tr transmitting to the receive module at, at another uh, node altogether. And the receiver, uh, another task running concurrently, uh, an induct, um, receives the data, then invokes a dispatch function that either uh, places the received bundle on the queue of bundles to be further forwarded, or else places it in the queue of bundles for delivery, and the application uh, pulls, running say, asynchronously with everything else, uh, calls a function that uh, causes the data to be delivered out of that queue and, and passed to the application. That's really the whole of ION. Everything else is making all that stuff work. Next slide. The design principles of ION kind of um, grow out of the, uh, the, 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 the constraints that I talked about earlier. Um, and there, there are three that, that are most notable, I think. One is um, shared memory, uh, you often don't have protected memory. Well, that can be a danger, but it can also be a strength because shared memory is a very, very fast way of moving data around. So as a, uh, a sort of doing, uh, killing two birds with one stone, we, we, in ION we uh, try to leverage the, the use of uh, shared memory to improve performance and uh, we have to deal with it anyway, so the, we have to design carefully in order to, to, to avoid um, problems that can come out of, of careless use of shared memory. So, um, so a typical structure in, in, in uh, data movement in ION is that the data doesn't move. It, it goes into a linked list, which is residing in the object database. The sender just puts it onto the linked list and gives a, a semaphore uh, the receiver uh, takes the semaphore and, and reads it from the linked list. Um, zero copy procedures, these are the zero copy objects I was uh, referring to earlier. Uh, again, leveraging shared memory to minimize the processing overhead. Uh, the, um, all the data is encapsulated in multiple layers of, of protocol overhead and that's all done just by accounting, not by actually uh, copying things into, into buffers. And, and, and that also enables the same data object to be shared by multiple tasks, so you have reference counting instead of um, multiple consumptions of the same data. Uh, and then portability. Uh, I mentioned before that um, ION is, is designed to be extremely portable, and that's because the, the shared memory, non-protected memory kind of uh, and real-time operating system environment is, a, I know from personal experience, a difficult environment to do software development in. It's much better, much easier to do your development in, say, Linux, and then recompile it for VxWorks than the other way around. 
So portability is important, not only in terms of, of um, exposing the software to the widest possible market, but also uh, in terms of uh, making the development easier. It's much easier to do the development if you can port it after it's been, after you've, you've made the changes to the, to the Linux code, for example. Next slide. Um, the uh, first major demonstration of, uh, of the ION code was in the Deep Impact uh, Network experiment we did in 2008, where the, uh, uh, the Deep Impact uh, mission, uh, the Comet uh, mission, uh, was, uh, had, had been repurposed to explore another comet. That is, the Deep Impact was two spacecraft. There was an impactor that crashed into a comet. There was a flyby that took pictures of that, and then the flyby survived went on to visit another comet, and while it was en route to another comet, we borrowed it for uh, about two months and loaded um, the ION software onto the spacecraft and operated it as a, as a router in deep space. At the time, it was, uh, I think it varied between 81 and 49 uh, light seconds uh, distance from Earth, uh, around a maximum, I think, around 15 million miles, uh, and we uh, uploaded uh, data from one node inside building 238 at JPL to another node inside building 238 at JPL, but through the spacecraft. You know, this spacecraft was a router, so the round trip time was on the order of uh, oh, 100 to 160 seconds. Uh, and that worked very well. Um, the, it was a, a quite an early version of the ION software, but it, it still was uh, uh, quite successful in, in moving data without data loss through the course of uh, uh, multiple uh, deep space uh, network contacts, uh, resulting in, in really effective round trip times of up to two days. So uh, it demonstrated uh, some uh, um, quite solid um, delay tolerance and, and robustness, because in, in a couple of, uh, on a couple of occasions, we had uh, deep space network uh, uh, antennas that failed in the course of doing transmission and the ION software recovered from that. Next slide. So uh, here's a, a brief history of, of uh, the progress of, of the ION development so far. Um, it really sort of goes back to about 1996 when some of the infrastructure uh, that ION is based on was developed in the uh, flight system test bed at JPL. The, dynamic memory management, the object database, and the portability layer. Um, we began uh, doing uh, uh, IPN and ultimately DTN research in 19, late 1997, early 1998. Uh, the, the first prototype implementation of DTN was uh, DTN1, and that was done in the um, middle of uh, 2002, I think. Um, DTN2 was started about a year after that, and the beginning of, of the ION implementation as an uh, as a implementation of DTN itself really started uh, right after that in, in 2004. Uh, so the bundle protocol implementation and the, the zero copy objects implementation happened in 2004. Uh, 2006 and a half, uh, the BP bundle protocol spec was published. Um, the LTP implementation and contact graph routing were added to ION about, uh, well, toward the end of that year. Um, Deep Impact was 2008, uh, and in 2009, we began running those uh, CGBAs on, on ISS. Th those were running ION. Um, the uh, implementations of uh, the CCSDS bundle uh, uh, file delivery protocol and the bundle security protocol came along at, at the end of 2009. Uh, the Windows port was uh, 2011, I think. Bundle streaming service, which is uh, uh, aimed at, at enabling uh, con um, continuous streaming of video uh, over DTN, uh, came on a little bit after that. A multicast, a delay tolerant payload conditioning, and uh, and the the uh, port of uh, uh, DTN Perf, the um, DTN performance evaluation system developed at the University of Bologna, um, came in uh, toward the end of last, uh, well, yeah, to last year. Uh, and, uh, and at the really close to the very end of, of 2014, uh, we worked on uh, 
improving the port to the uh, common flight software for AES missions. And, uh, and then at the beginning of 2015, an implementation of the streamlined bundle security protocol and bundle-in-bundle uh, -bundle encapsulation. That sort of brings us up to where we are now. So next slide. Uh, version 3.3.0 uh, of ION was released in, uh, at the early part of March. The focus there was really security, and this was uh, the SBSP implementation and bundle and bundle encapsulation for uh, cross-domain uh, solution to security. Um, and it also included uh, dynamic computation of uh, the reporting limits in LTP uh, to enable uh, large blocks to be um, transmitted uh, in, in fewer iterations and with, with less uh, re-forwarding. Um, and uh, there was also improved support for ISS operations, um, uh, working with Tyler to get uh, 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 flow control uh, for the s uh, simple TCP convergence layer, uh, working well for uh, the ISS operational environment. Next slide. Uh, the most, most recent work, and this is less than a month ago, um, ION 3.3.1, a point release was, was issued. Uh, that included some additional features and bug fixes, mainly aimed at, at supporting the ISS deployment. Uh, there were uh, some um, things that needed to be done on the Windows port in particular, uh, in, in semaphore management that we hadn't noticed before until we started doing some uh, heavy uh, uh, testing in, in Windows. Uh, and there was a, 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 a sort of an obscure feature about uh, uh, dynamically rebinding TCP connections that turns out to be very useful for uh, the way uh, ISS is going to be uh, operating the, the, the TCP uh, convergence layer. Uh, there also were a couple of other bug fixes that came out of uh, uh, the CCSTS bundle protocol interoperability testing with JAXA. Uh, testing between ION and DTN2, and uh, and as part of that release, we also slipped in a, a couple of updates to the uh, ION tutorial, which was many years out of date by this point. Next slide. So uh, next coming up, and this is uh, the target here is early July. Uh, that originally was going to be end of May, but. Uh, it was really important to do the ISS work, and so some of this other work uh, slipped a bit. So we're at least a month behind on, on, on getting uh, the 3.4 um, features uh, out. Uh, but the, the, it, we're getting to work on it now. Um, the focus there is on terrestrial DTN, on being able to use the ION implementation not only for uh, spaceflight missions, but also in the sort of uh, opportunistic uh, uh, and probabilistic uh, terrestrial uh, DTN forwarding uh, environment. Uh, so that includes an implementation of the contact discovery protocol that's being done by uh, uh, the top coder uh, community. Uh, and, and there's actually been uh, an almost complete implementation of that done now that looks like pretty good code, uh, the little I've seen of it so far. Um, we're going to need some sort of a protocol for exchanging contact plans between um, uh, nodes that opportunistically discover each other. And the, the rationale there is there have been um, a, a, a very large number of uh, routing schemes developed for, for opportunistic uh, forwarding in terrestrial DTN. Um, and my hypothesis here is that uh, that the contact graph routing that we've been using for uh, routing in, in uh, interplanetary networking is actually a good way of doing opportunistic uh, 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 terrestrial networking net for routing as well uh, because it's based on the best available knowledge of the topology, like uh, all terrest like all internet uh, uh, routing protocols, rather than sort of um, just being behavioral. Um, that may or may not be true, and that's what we're going to discover as we uh, press ahead with this. But the idea there is that uh, the contact plan that you use for computing uh, routes through the, 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 through the space network 
uh, is based currently on uh, contacts that are scheduled and anticipated, planned, and, and will happen with some very small probability that something will be missed. Um, if we add to that structure uh, contacts that we think will happen, that have some probability of, of, of occurring, that maybe we learn from contact with, with other nodes and, and, and exchanging what we know of, of, of each other's past history, then we can build a, a contact plan that has, uh, it doesn't have as much certainty in it, but has a certain degree of probability that is maybe reinforced by uh, continued contact. And, and we can use that as the basis not for saying, okay, it's gonna go this way, so I'll send the copy this way and I'm all done, but instead saying, uh, it might go this way, so uh, let's send a copy that way and, and keep track of the fact that we, we did it and we have some degree of confidence that it'll work. And let's do that again and then again until finally at some point we've, we've sent enough copies that we, th we have enough confidence that we think, oh, well, now it's, we've probably done it enough. And, 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 and at that point, uh, discard the, 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 the copy of the bundle that has been transmitted because you don't need to stop, don't need to transmit it anymore. Um, so that involves uh, 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 inference of probabilistic contacts, which also is a, a kind of a research problem. We'll do something primitive, I think, for, for the, the uh, uh, 340 release and try to refine that over time. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, and uh, and the uh, the last point there is that uh, that the uh, the motivation for for a lot of this stuff is that uh, for flight operations, you know, the the end to end network that we use to operate spacecraft in, includes people who uh, might be in charge of, of uh, uh, operating instruments or, or uh, elements of a spacecraft that are not necessarily at their desks at the time something happens, so you need to be able to reach out into the terrestrial network with uh, opportunistic forwarding uh, to reach those people. The ground operations are uh, an important part of the end-to-end -end, um, uh, spaceflight operations network. Um, another uh, possibility for 330, 340 rather is uh, the delay tolerant key administration um, system that we've been working on for uh, about a year or so, uh, that's in the process of being approved for open source release uh, within JPL. It may or may not happen in time for the uh, 340 release. If it does, then I think that'd be a good thing to get out as well. Next slide. Um, looking further ahead, uh, 350, and this is uh, the, the target, the original target for this was uh, end of uh, the U.S. government fiscal year uh, 15. It may slip a little beyond that. Uh, and, and the focus that I have in mind for this is scalability. Uh, it, it's great to be able to do terrestrial networking, but it's not going to solve a lot unless we are ultimately able to scale it up to very large the, the, the very large number of users that we expect to see in a terrestrial network. And so uh, my thinking here is that uh, we're going to need some sort of a, a registration that will actually not be delay tolerant necessarily, but will uh, be sufficiently delay tolerant for the purposes of, 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 of the, for the limited purposes of registration that I think we need to have in order to uh, have um, uh, uh, scalable routing, which I, I believe is going to depend on, on being able to carve out uh, regions within which contact graph routing can work. The contact graph routing itself, uh, it seems unlikely we're ever going to be able to get CGR to scale up to more than, uh, oh, somewhere between 50 and 100 nodes uh, and, and operate quickly. And so uh, I think in order to, to scale up to a, a large network, we're going to need to carve up the, that, that large network into uh, something very much like the Internet's autonomous regions that um, uh, conduct uh, CGR within them and then have some sort of a BGP-like uh, protocol that, uh, uh, that, that manages um, uh, forwarding of data from one region to another through uh, gateways that are well known. Um, I think that, uh, uh, well, uh, auto configuration of nodes is, is going to 
be a, uh, pretty much required for this because we're not going to be able to do the, the, the sort of uh, node management that we can do for spaceflight missions if we're going to have a million or, or 100 million um, individuals uh, participating in the network. Uh, and, and I think that um, ultimately multicast is going to be uh, key to making this work. I think that um, when nodes join this network, they're not going to uh, know what every other node in the network uh, uh, is prepared to send to them and, and who they are and, and, and what, what to send to them um, by any way other than, uh, than multicast. And I think that's a, uh, a doable thing. We have a multicast implementation in, uh, in ION now and, uh, and I, I think that, it's, uh, uh, that building that capability out is going to be uh, really key to uh, making scalable terrestrial um, ION work. Um, next slide. Uh, looking out after 3.5.0, uh, there, uh, one thing that's certainly going to need to happen is as the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force DTN Working Group comes up with uh, definitions of, uh, new definitions of the protocols, uh, revised, implement, revised specifications for bundle protocol and, and bundle security protocol almost certainly and probably a few others as well. Uh, we'll need to re reflect uh, uh, th those changes in ION. Uh, I think that's, um, and so far I'm not concerned about that. I think it's going to be relatively straightforward and if anything it'll make, um, if, 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 if things follow the direction that I'm hoping they'll take, it'll make uh, ION uh, simpler and somewhat smaller and easier to manage. Um, Again, coming back to uh, multicast, uh, there's a, 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 the BP multicast that is built into ION has a, a reliance on an underlying uh, spanning tree which is currently managed uh, uh, by, by administration, by, by management, and that needs to be automated. Uh, we've had a design for a, a, a spanning tree maintenance protocol sitting around for several years and uh, at some point somebody's going to have to bite the bullet and actually implement that. Um, and, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, um, the, the having, having contact plans, including uh, probabilistic contact plans that, that, um, uh, that cover the, the terrestrial uh, uh, delay tolerant networking environment, um, gives us the ability to um, compute to some degree, to some, to some probability, the uh, expected uh, delivery time for a bundle. And, and that, in turn, uh, gives us the ability to um, support congestion control even in, in delay tolerant networking, in, in, sorry, in terrestrial delay tolerant networking, I think. That's, uh, again, congesture, but I, th I think that's uh, that's a, a function that we're going to be able to get, uh, given uh, given uh, contact plans that cover the whole, uh, that cover the, the terrestrial uh, networking environment. I think we can use those for accurate, uh, relatively accurate uh, congestion forecasting and, and uh, uh, time to live estimation to control congestion. Next slide. Um, then the and then further off and even even less fully thought out at this point, uh, the the registration infrastructure that I think we're going to need for um, uh, uh, for scalable terrestrial DTN uh, anyway, uh, I think ultimately can be used to um, implement um, uh, uh, configuration of new nodes in, in a more powerful, more useful way. Uh, in, in to be determined. We haven't even thought very much hard about this yet. Um, and then the, the last thing, which I, uh, I think I also mentioned earlier, um, and you give, just uh, give a little bit of uh, background on this. Back when the, the uh, DARPA uh, funding for uh, DTN was the, the main source of, of development, and this is in uh, 
2005, 2006, 2007, the program manager for that DARPA DTN project was Preston Marshall, and the, the thing that he really wanted to see come out of that work was what he referred to as a self-forming Akamai, that is uh, uh, um, sort of automatic pre-placement of, of data that, that, um, that, that combat units would need that they didn't know they needed yet, or that you wouldn't be able to get to them because they're out of contact. Um, but if you could, if you could pre-place it, then when they did need it, they could ask for it and it would already be there and they wouldn't have to come all the way back to uh, Columbia to, to get the data. Um, if you take a step back and, and look a little sideways at that, and that looks similar, very similar to, to what's being called uh, information-centric networking as developed over the last oh, four or five, six years. Uh, I think, and this is a, a personal opinion that is yet to be validated, that, uh, that ICN, as it's been developed so far, is a great concept, but I think it's using the wrong, um, I, I think it's using the, the wrong technology. It's based on the naming of objects. I think what would be uh, more powerful is to base um, uh, information-centric networking on the content of objects and to do that with um, with multicast and with uh, uh, search engines embedded inside the, the multicast nodes. So I think that a, a DTN-based ICN approach is ultimately going to be a, a more powerful way to, um, to accomplish information-centric networking. And I look forward to having a chance to work on that in a couple of years. And I think that's all my slides. I've got some backup slides, but I'll stop there and, and ask if there are any questions. that I found very interesting with this presentation. Uh, the first was the mention of the opportunistic net networking. If you remember earlier when I was answering a question, I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know that you were working on that as a contact graph integration. And, and so there's, there's actually, I, th I think maybe there's sort of, um, in, in a sense, there's two dimensions to that. There's, there's uh, opportunistic uh, networking where you know who you're going to talk to, and you don't know who yet. Or you don't know when yet. And then there's opportunistic networking where you don't even know who you're going to talk to yet. The 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 former, I think we've we've made pretty good strides toward for for ISS, where uh, when the when the contact is there with somebody that you expect to talk to, you pick it up and you begin to use it. Um, the the new thing that doesn't exist yet is uh, opportunistic networking with somebody you don't know. It, it, they just randomly bumped into you and you say, oh, well, okay, let's talk. Uh, I actually have another question if, if nobody else has another one to answer. The, uh, the other thing I've, I've been working a lot lately in is uh, LDAP. Uh, oh, yeah. Very tangentially yeah. in preparation for getting uh, yeah. ion. And, and, and I think the registration stuff that I've been talking about, the first thing that came to my mind was I was looking at it was this, we need to do this with LDAP. I'd be curious to see uh, about a DTN-ized um, LDAP synchronization protocol. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, what a great idea. Yeah. Let's, let's um, think about that. And, and there is a, a question from the webcast. Sure. And again, this is from Scott Johnson. Uh, and he's asking, um, you know, how does the size of the block of memory that's assigned to ION vary? Is it, uh, for example, a variable pass to the kernel at boot time, or is there some other mechanism? It, uh, good question. It's, it's a configuration parameter that uh, in in the ion world, you you um, supply at the at the time you instantiate the node. Um, it is fixed for the life of the node, so uh, you 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 want to take a pretty good guess at it, or else you want to be able to save state off to to uh, uh, some other medium, and then just blow the node away and 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 re, and re instantiate it with uh, uh, with a larger uh, fixed size. And, and then reload it. Um, 
uh, historically that has not been a big problem. Um, the nodes that, uh, that we use in, in, in testing and in operations so far, um, we, we typically allocate sort of as much uh, storage as, uh, as, as is comfortable and just uh, uh, and live within whatever that, that amount is. So, so it's kind of driven by the hardware configuration that's available. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are, um, and let me moderate that in 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 one way, which is to say that um, for uh, for an operational deployment, if you uh, instantiate your nodes and run some testing, there are tools provided in Ion for uh, inspecting how much um, uh, um, how much uh, non-volatile um, database heap space you're using, what, what, what your high watermark is, and what your high watermark in, in uh, working memory is. And uh, if you uh, uh, do a, a, a full round of testing for, for a few months and, 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 and record those numbers, well, chances are when you instantiate uh, the, the, the real operational nodes, if you take those numbers and add 50%, you're, you, you're probably using um, your storage resources fairly efficiently. And, and this is for me. So um, what is driving the uh, requirement for multicast in a DTN environment? Yeah, well, um, uh, I think it's a couple of things. Uh, one is, uh, looking down the road, uh, I, I don't see any way other than multicast to uh, really um, inform nodes efficiently about what one another wants to see. Right? And it, it's the, 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 there's a profound difference here between DTN and, uh, and what you typically do in the internet. Uh, in the internet, you can do uh, um, query-based, you know, client-server operations because your round-trip times are small, and it's that's the a standard mode for, of, of operation for, for applications is client-server. In uh, in in a DTN, you can't necessarily rely on being able to do client-server. You can't necessarily rely on being able to do an efficient conversation. What you need to do instead is convey information in advance to the nodes before they need to act on it and multicast is a, a perfect vehicle for that. You convey to everybody, here's what I want. Whenever you get around to having it, send it to me. I'm not going to ask for it. I've already asked for it. This is it. Um, so there's a, there's a fundamental, um, uh, very close fit, I think, between multicast and, and, the, and the natural way that the DTN operates. Um, going, narrowing down a little bit more closely, um, the, uh, the, the delay tolerant key administration system that we've been working on for a year or so uh, relies very much on, on multicast uh, because it's, uh, it's based on um, a, a collaborative authorization of, of uh, distribution of, of public information and, and, and multicast is very key to that. And, and I think that there will be other um, other applications for um, really trustworthy, uh, robust uh, data distribution that that model is perfect for, uh, not just key distribution, but other kinds of, of critical uh, information for enterprises of any kind. Uh, the, and, and all of that is going to be ultimately based on, on getting multicast working right. So I think multicast is, is, is really central to the future of DTN. Need the okay. Uh, I apologize for having to duck out for a phone call. Um, what about node discovery? If, did you already talk about that? Uh, uh, because multicast sort of makes me think of node yeah, discovery or um, you know node announcement. Yeah, absolutely. The, and this is something that we're going to be um, um, we're, we're starting on. In fact, now um, uh, for the three four zero release of Ion, which we're targeting. July, it may slip a little bit, uh, but at the, at the moment we're targeting July. Um, part of that is going to be, uh, the focus of, of the 340 uh, release is going to be 
um, adapting ION to terrestrial networking. And a big part of that is, uh, um, I, I think of it as contact discovery rather than neighbor discovery. Once you've, once you've discovered the contact, you can infer the neighbor. Um, the implementation of the uh, IPND um, RFC, I think, is already being uh, undertaken by uh, the top coder group, and uh, they've got an implementation. They've got they've got code. Uh, it hasn't been fully integrated yet. We need to integrate it and test it. But uh, I think they've made pretty good progress on that, and I think that's yeah, that's that's really a precondition to any of this stuff. Yeah. I I had an interesting, painful experience this weekend. Um, with uh, a protocol called Bonjour, oh. which is, is, uh, has been rewritten for the latest version of the Mac operating system uh, and didn't seem to work as well as the previous version. Uh, but I hadn't appreciated is how many places that particular kind of discovery protocol is now being used. I mean, it's lots and lots of devices participate in that sure. to make themselves visible. I, that's going to be like, you have to have that for Internet of Things, right? I mean, how else can yeah, you make it work? Yeah, you know, how else would you figure yeah. it out? And then you have the problem of making sure that you're not configuring in your neighbor's stuff and, and the 15-year-old isn't configuring your stuff and yeah, yeah. all that other stuff. So um, the reason I bring it up, though, is that this could turn into an extremely important aspect of the DTN protocol, because the more I think about Internet of Things and battery-based things and devices that are trying to uh, be th thoughtful about their duty cycle and everything else, that the need to have these discovery mechanisms is going to uh, escalate. So I'm let, glad that you are thinking let me, about that. Let me add something to that. Uh, this is sort of fortuitously at the, the last uh, IETF. Um, I talked with a couple of guys from, uh, I can't remember, the, in the, I think it was Airbus, uh, who have been uh, working on, uh, in another IETF uh, working group track altogether, on um, uh, essentially a contact discovery mechanism that is at a lower layer. It's, a, it's an RF contact discovery system rather than an IP contact discovery mechanism, which I think is, um, uh, has, has a, a lot of potential. I, I think that's, there's a, a lot of potential value there. Uh, they're, then they're very interested in, in integrating with, with the, the work we're doing. I think you're talking about neighbor discovery. Pardon me? You're talking about neighbor discovery? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, that would be the guys from Airbus because they're in the main agency. Yes, community. right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, well, and I, I should, John Dowdell, I think, was one of them. Dowdell and Rick uh, Taylor. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's fair to observe that radio has this uh, potential to be heard in more than one place at the same time, and that makes it useful for this sort of broadcast uh, yeah. uh, discovery mechanism. Okay, anything else before uh, we finish up with, oh, okay, so I guess we should thank Scott. Thank you.